Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I am cold. We are coming to you from Packer Country, just outside of Milwaukee, because we are going to go see the birth home of a man that we knew as the Great Liberace. Days with Jordan the Lion and you all. It begins right now. And look who else is here. Look at that handsome face. So this was the childhood neighborhood of Vlasio Valentino Liberace. He was named after, of course, Rudy Valentino, or at least the middle name. But his name was Polish, and it translated in Polish, Vlasiu was actually Walter. So as a little boy, he went by Walter. Now his parents, his father was from just outside Naples, Italy, and he was a professional French horn player. And Liberace's mother was Polish-German, and she also came from a musical family. So they got married and apparently his mother was a, an assistant to Paderowski who was one of Liberace's heroes later on in life, a Polish piano player. So they immigrated to America, moved here. They had a son named George, a daughter named Angela. And Sal, the father, wasn't making quite enough money so he opened a grocery store in addition to playing French horn. Now, in 1919, young Liberace was born. So his childhood home is actually right over here. And this was his birth home. Also, the home that he learned to play music in, right there. He was a virtuoso. I mean, he was he was amazing from the earliest of ages. See, his father, of course, like I said, was a professional French horn player. But his older brother, George, was an accomplished virtuoso violin player. So George would practice on the second floor up here. And on the first floor, his mother and father would rehearse their music and then Angela wanted to play piano so they got a piano and that was also on the first floor but when Walter was four he started to show interest in piano he wanted to play the piano he loved it he loved banging on it his father said well your brother's a great violin player so we're not paying for piano lessons when you can learn violin so he started to teach him up there on the second floor and Little Walter said he had no interest. He said when, by the time the bow hit the string, he heard that sound, he hated it. So he said he had no interest. So his father tried to teach him French horn. He said he had even less interest in that, but he loved the piano. So they got him piano lessons and he started learning quick. So then they got him a good teacher from a, it was actually the Wisconsin College of Music. And she started to teach him and he ended up saying, I found an interview where he said this, he, he was granted a scholarship. He got a 17 year scholarship. He said it was the longest scholarship they ever gave when they saw him play to, uh, to attend the college. So he grew up here. He said it was a very village-like neighborhood. They were not rich by any means. He said his love of clothes actually came from having to wear all of George's hand-me-downs but it was a very village-like neighborhood at the time. And um, he said so everybody knew that he was a good piano player, so whenever they needed somebody, they always came to him. So he would always end up playing for like fashion shows, weddings, 
anything in school, anything for churches. He was always playing. So he said he kind of got the idea like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm a big frog in a small pond. This is great. Like he just had an early inkling that he was going to be great, but he was a very sick kid. He was always sick. In fact, he never liked to go outside and play. He always wanted to stay inside. He said he was just obsessed with playing piano. He loved playing it so much that he says parents would actually say, go outside, quit playing that racket, quit doing that. And his father would say, your skin's getting pale. You gotta go out and get some sun. But you know, it paid off because he became one of the most well-known piano virtuosos in the last hundred years. His father demanded that all the kids, because they did eventually later on have another um, son that they named Rudolph. So there was a Rudolph and a Valentino in the family. He, uh, he wanted all the kids to play an instrument and um, also wanted them to be classical, wanted them to play classical music. But George said even he was recognizing that you really couldn't make a good living. And so they learned all the classical stuff. But when Walter, he actually would eventually go by Liberace only, but he would have his friends call him Lee. So while he lived in this area in Wisconsin for the years growing up, he would always go by Walter, but eventually he would be known as Lee. So I, I'm going to call him Walter during these years. Once he started attending the Wisconsin College of Music, he also started performing in like bars and taverns with bands. And so he was kind of both doing classical virtuoso music, getting hired for that. And then he was also playing in like the taverns, playing modern stuff that he wanted to play. And he said that it ended up causing a problem because he said he thought when he left here, he was gonna easily break into the business and easily get a job. And he said he found very quickly that the world was not waiting for him. So he ended up having to teach piano to children. He said he had like 30 students and some of them he said he, they couldn't even pay, but the best ones that he taught were the ones that couldn't pay. And he just loved to see the joy that music brings. So that followed him throughout his life. He said, that's why he always continued to perform for all those years because he just saw how happy it made people. So like I said, he would wear his brother's hand-me-downs while they were growing up here, but eventually when he could afford really fancy clothes and everything, he said he would get everything made in three sizes because he didn't want to deprive himself of a good meal. So he had skinny size, fat size, and impossible size. <laughs> so he'd have three versions of everything made. He went off and was doing all those tavern gigs and then had an opportunity where he was gonna join the Chicago Symphony and they found out that he was out doing those tavern gigs and threatened to take away the offer. So he had to change his name for the rest of the six months before he joined them to play all those bar gigs. He eventually found his way to New York, was performing in the Plaza Hotel. He would tour for years and then he would end up on the radio and would find his way, he did a little bit of everything. His teacher here actually, when he was learning as a young man, she um, also had a second job of being on the radio. So she got him a weekly featured spot when he was a junior in high school on the radio. So he was a performer from the earliest time he could remember, he would say. So eventually when he got out to Hollywood, he got a local TV show and was doing all right. People just liked him, you know, he he would mix the classical with modern and a lot of humor and a lot of likability. And believe it or not, you know, it's kind of funny to think of now, but he was a major sex symbol. He would talk right to the camera when he did his show and people were really drawn into that. So he ended up getting offered to take over the summer hosting of the Dinosaur Show and he got a lot of fans from that and then they syndicated his LA show and he became huge. He actually had more 
uh, station syndicating his show than I Love Lucy. So he was more popular than I Love Lucy. His career would continue on. As we know, he would become a major mainstay in Vegas. On TV, he would be in movies. He was very, very, very generous. He would often gift people houses and clothes, and he would say that he thought he was gonna die at one point. They, he had kidney failure, and they told him he was gonna die. His family came and surrounded him at the hospital, and he asked his business manager, he said, take care of every one of my family, set them up for life, and everything that I care about, all the organizations, give them money, and then come back and tell me how much is left. So they came back and said, we have three quarters of a million dollars left. And so he said for two weeks, he spent that three quarters of a million dollars buying people gifts, buying motorcycles, buying houses for people, and then he recovered. And so he said he always had a, a true appreciation for everything he had, and so he said he would spend all the money on the clothes and the riches and everything because he said he knew people wanted to see that. And he loved, like I said, he loved the fans so much, he performed the entirety of his life and even when he was engaged to get married in the papers, which you know now we all knew that he was closeted homosexual, he was supposed to get married to one of his neighbors, uh, Joanna Rio, but when his fans that watched him on TV found out, they wrote tons of letters saying that they didn't want him to and that the only woman they wanted him to love was his mother. So he ended up breaking off the engagement where his love of all the uh, the Shining Clothes was in Hollywood. He was going to perform at the, they, the story goes, that he was going to perform at the Hollywood Bowl. And when he went to the top of the bowl, he said, I'm going to blend too much in with the LA Philharmonic. They're all wearing black and I'm wearing black. So he wanted to wear white. And from then on, he started thinking of how he looked on stage in a different light. So there you go. The childhood home of Walter Valentino Liberace. But, like I said, he thought that, he loved that his hero, Podrovsky, was just kind of known as one name. So he just started going by Liberace once his brother, George, joined his act and they started doing like publicity for him. His mother was obsessed with wrestling, so making like wrestling flyers, promoting Liberace and mailing him out to everywhere and that's really how his career started to take off, so kind of cool to see it all started here in Wisconsin. Of course he's buried in Los Angeles with basically his entire family other than his father. You know he took care of his mother her entire life because his father started cheating on the mother and then divorced her and he just felt so bad for her that he took care of her the rest of her life and took her to all of his premieres and everything so they are all buried out together at uh, Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, Jake, for becoming my newest Patreon, and we will see you all next time. Have a great night, and goodbye.